Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the sixth episode in my series on the murder of Inga Lodz. If you support what I do, I would greatly appreciate it if you could subscribe to this channel. It's completely free and will keep me motivated to keep on producing interesting and thought-provoking videos. Thank you. Now, in the previous episode, we have seen how, on the basis of the fingerprint evidence, the hammer, as well as the letter, the police arrested Fred van der Paper for the murder of Inga Lodz. We've also seen how incriminating this fingerprint evidence was in that it places him at the crime scene and not at his work as he claimed he was. And then in November 2007, the following happened. And the So how was that possible? The one moment we had the fingerprint evidence, and the next moment we have the judge declaring Fred innocent. This episode is about what happened, about how one of the greatest miscarriages of justice in South Africa was pulled off. Now, right from the start, the defense must have known that in order to keep Fred out of Polsenu prison, serving a life sentence, they had to neutralize this fingerprint evidence at all costs, doesn't matter what it takes. Because without it, the state would have had a tough time to prove the case beyond reasonable doubt, based only on the circumstantial evidence of the hammer, the letter, and later the superint evidence. So what did the defense do? Although I have no information, I imagine that the first thing that they did was to get their own experts to compare the prints and fall in one with those of Fred from the paper to make sure that Captain Bester didn't make a mistake. Well, it turns out that Captain Bester didn't make a mistake. Every defense expert that ever looked at these prints agreed that they belonged to Fred van der Paper. So that the prints on Folion 1 belong to Fred van der Paper is an accepted fact, accepted by the defense experts, by the state experts, as well as by the court. So that is to settle that Captain Bester didn't make a mistake. The defense's next line of attack was to claim that Folion 1 was not lifted from a DVD, but from another object. In, in other words, that Constable Swartz made a mistake somehow. Now, to be honest, I really can't blame anyone to be very confused and suspicious about Polyon 1 at the onset. At first glance, it doesn't look like Polyon 1 could be from a DVD holder. DVD holder have straight edges, there are no curved edges, and there are no lines 18 about 80 millimeters apart that could have produced these two uh, parallel curves. In large part, the confusion stems from the fact that Constable Schwartz did not record in his crime scene notes nor his initial affidavits that he took a first lift over the bottom half of the DVD and then he threw it away when he noticed that the prints on it were just smudges and not usable. He didn't think that it was important to keep this that lift because it would serve no purpose. Just remember that at that time, Constable Schwartz could not have known how important Volume 1 and the DVD holder would become in this case. If he did indeed make a, make a note of this in his uh, reports, then this case may have gone in a completely different direction, a different outcome. And then again, maybe not considering the lines the defense were willing to cross to keep Fred out of prison. Now, initially, Folion 1 was studied by Dr. David Klatzow, a forensic consultant, as you may well know, and Niku Kotze, a private fingerprint expert that was retained by the defense. They were immediately concerned about the two curved and parallel lines about 18 millimeters apart and that it was not possible to produce such a lift from a DVD holder that only have straight edges. So in August 2005, 
the two of them spent an afternoon going through Inga's apartment, looking for a surface from which pollen could have been lifted. The search was futile. Now, it does not seem like any of these experts actually made an honest effort to try and figure out how Folian 1 could have been from a DVD cover. Their starting point was that Constable Swartz made a mistake and they moved onwards from there. I can guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, that if Folian 1 was given to my brother Thomas Mollett, he would have been able to figure out on his own that there was a first lift over the bottom half without Constable Swartz having to say so. And he would have been able to explain why the lines appear curved. It's not that difficult to figure out if you are really interested in getting to the truth. Apparently, Nico Kotso and Mike Grace, another independent forensic expert uh, hired by the defense, uh, took several lifts from the DVD covers and they couldn't figure it out. So in, uh, on the 24th of October, 2005, Dan Becker, another private finger expert, received a file with photos and documentation and fingerprint from the Office of Forensic, Forensic Pathologist, Professor Gert Simon, at the behest of Advocate Duke de Brain, who was the advocate retained by Fred Bennett Baker. And he wanted Becker to give his expert opinion on Pauline 1. Now, this is the same Professor Simon who later provided expert testimony for the defense on head wounds and ornamental hammer as a potential murder weapon. So you can read more about Don Becker's report in uh, our book, Bloody Lies. In his report dated November 29th, 2005, his final conclusion was that Poland 1 was lifted from a drinking glass. He claimed that the top and bottom curve in Poland 1 were made by the top and bottom edges of a typical whiskey glass about 80 millimeters high. Tall. Now, Dan Becker provided the defense of something none of the other experts, such as Dr. David Klatzow and fingerprint experts Nicole Kotze and Mike Grace, could accomplish to identify possible objects from which Polyon 1 could have been lifted. Although Dr. Klatzow and Kotze initially suspected Polyon 1 was taken from a curved surface, neither he nor Kotze or Grace could make a connection to a drinking glass. Now, why is it that these experts did not come up with the idea of a drinking glass themselves? Did they perhaps realize that the shape of the curves were not perfectly circular as they should be if they were from a glass? Did they know that this mark was made by a finger in a latex glove and not by a human lip? Now, knowing by now that the fans were seriously questioning the legitimacy of Polyon 1, uh, Director Ati Trollope requested a ballistics expert Superintendent Rance to examine Polyon 1 and the DVD cover to see if there was a match between the two. So after inspecting Polyon 1 and the DVD cover, and after supposedly using his knowledge and skills in certain branches of physics and ballistics, Rance concluded that the physical match of Polyon 1 and the DVD cover is not possible due to the incompatibility of the materials for such an examination. So uh, apparently after the Dan Becker report came out, there was a meeting between the state and the defense. I can only assume that the defense was trying to use the Becker report to get the state to drop the case against uh, Fred van der Pepper. It seems that they jointly agreed to get another independent person to study Polyon 1. So it was agreed to request Director Ruben Buerta and Superintendent Mayer from the LCRC in King Williamstown to evaluate Folion 1. Now, being from King Williamstown, Buerta and Mayer were far removed from the ongoing investigation in Cape Town and Stellenbosch. Now, unlike Becker, Buerta actually viewed the crime scene video and also interviewed Constable Swartz. Inspector Boysons and their supervisor, Captain Matthias. He also, he also visited the home of Mrs. Lotz in Belgemut, 
The study does sizes and appearances of all possible glass that the sea has collected from Inga's flat. Laborta got Constable Swart to show him how Volume 1 was lifted. It was then, and only then, that he came to light that Swartz did the double lift. The first bad lift over the bottom half, then the second lift over the top half that produced Volume 1. Porter also explained that the curved notch of the top line was formed by uneven bending of the folion over the top edge of the DVD holder as Swartz applied pressure to it, more to the middle and less to the edges. Porter concluded that the fingerprints found and lifted by means of folion 1 correspond to those of Mr. Fun of Paper. Very possibly, the fingerprints lifted by Constable Swartz originated from the open DVD holder found on a coffee table on top of the magazines. Now, right up to Porter's investigation, I would agree that doubts about the legitimacy of folion 1 were understandable. Without knowing about the first lift, it would have been very difficult to explain how the bottom line in particular came from a DVD holder. Difficult, but not impossible. However, after Borta's investigation, the game changed. The defense did not like Borta's report at all because it put a big crack for their drinking glass theory and provided a plausible explanation why it was possible to find two lines. 18 millimeters apart on a DVD holder. Fred said this in his plea explanation. It will be argued on my behalf that in light of Superintendent Rance's report, that there can be no doubt that the report by Mr. Sporta and Mayer, note that he didn't use the ranks, was a dishonest attempt to support the state's case, as it was at the time that the fingerprint on Pauline 1 came from a DVD holder. Later, you will see how the defense brought in a, a fingerprint expert from the Netherlands, Ari Zillember, to testify at the trial. And it's clear that one of his primary objectives was to discredit Porter's report and the findings therein. Now, the defense must have had some serious doubt in their ability using local experts to explain to the court why Volume 1 could not be from a DVD holder especially in light of the Porta report. But not only did they have to make a solid technical argument, they also had to provide an explanation as to how it came to be that the lift taken from a drinking glass came to be labeled as being from a DVD holder. The fans must have thought long and hard about this and must have come to the same conclusion anyone else would, is that there is just simply not sufficient evidence to support an accidental mislabeling, and it just doesn't make any logical sense. Because Constable Swartz only took 11 lifts, that is not disputed. It's also undisputed that he took a lift from a DVD holder. If Folion 1 was from a drinking glass, then where is the actual lift from a DVD holder? It's not one of the 10 lifts. And if the DVD holder lift was lost or misplaced by accident, it means that 12 lifts were taken, and we know this was not the case. Another scenario is that back at the police station, a lift from another crime scene somehow got mixed up with the lift from the Iraq crime scene, and one of them got mislabeled as Polyon 1. But this begs the question, ladies and gentlemen, what's the likelihood that Fred's fingerprints were found on a drinking glass at another crime scene. And what were his fingerprints doing at that crime scene? Now, this left the defense with no choice but to argue that the police fabricated Volume 1 to frame Fred for a murder he did not commit. Then Louis van der Faber found Pat Bertheim, a fingerprint expert from Tucson in Arizona, a self-proclaimed expert in fingerprint fabrication. Now, in the industry, he was one of the heroes of the Shirley McKee case in Scotland. In this case, Bertheim was instrumental in getting the charges against Shirley 
a key dropped. After he accused the Scottish Fingerprint Office of fabricating incriminating fingerprint evidence against Shirley McKee. Now it should be noted that later the Scottish government appointed a special commission of inquiry and they found that there was no evidence whatsoever that the fingerprint was fabricated, simply that the Scottish police made a mistake. So in July 2006, Louis van der Peter flew to Arizona to meet with Pat Bertheim, bringing with him photos of the two folien and the nine tablets, original of Fred uh, inked fingerprints, as well as copies of Don Becker and Ruben Bortas reports. According to Bertheim, he was requested to evaluate the crime scene and fingerprint evidence with special attention to the analysis of folien 1 and to compare the latent prints of Folion 1 to the fingerprints of Fred Van der Paper. The first thing at that time was that Bertram did was to confirm that the left index finger and right thumb prints on Folion 1 were a positive match to Fred Van der Paper. Now, before we proceed to look at that Bertram's investigation, let me briefly recap as to what is expected of a forensic expert when doing an investigation. As per the International Association of Identification's Code of Ethics and Standards of Professional Conduct. Now, the IAI is a professional organization based in the US and they train and certify forensic experts. And they have a set of a code of ethics and a standards of professional conduct that all their members must abide by. Well, the first one is, is unbiased, objective, approaching all assignments and examinations with due diligence and an open mind, conducts full and fair examinations in which conclusions are based on the evidence and reference materials relevant to the evidence, not extraneous information, political pressure, or outside influences. Now, a forensic investigator must therefore make every possible effort to shield him or herself from outside influences that may influence their work and may cause them to become biased at a conscious or a subconscious level. But to this end, you certainly cannot allow your client to be present during your investigation in case he or she whispers sweet little lies in your ears and tell you things that you don't need to know, that is not relevant to the task at hand. If you've been asked, for example, to look at the fingerprint, you don't need to know about the alibi, nor about the relationship between the suspect and the accused. It's not even necessary for you to know the name of the victim or how the crime was committed. And yet here we have Pat Bertheim working under the watchful gaze of his paying client, Louis van der Feiter. And apparently Pat, was paid quite a hefty sum for his services. Now, what did Louis van der Feyfer tell Bertheim while all of this was going on? I don't know for sure, but I can guess that at the minimum, Bertheim was told about Fred's rock solid alibi and how the police was going after him in spite of this alibi. The inference would therefore be that Pauline One could not possibly have been from a DVD holder. So, how did Wertheim understand the alibi? Now, the day after the end of the trial, on November the 30th, 2007, Wertheim started a, a, thread, a thread on the CLPEX website, an online discussion group for uh, latent fingerprint examiners. And this is what uh, Wertheim said in his very first post. Finally, Mr. Van der Paper had an ironclad alibi as he was in a business meeting with other people all afternoon at his place of work, an hour's drive from the murder scene. He never left the meeting, but would have had to been gone for over two hours just to drive to the scene and back. In a later post what I'm said, third, Mr. Van der Feyfer's cell phone records and emails prove that he had been in the office that afternoon. Under the lack of emails, or phone calls for a two-hour period provided the police with the time window that they claimed he had left. 
committed the murder and returned to work. So, on first time's understanding, it would have taken Fred two hours to drive to Inga's place and back, and that the window period of no activity was two hours, which means there would have been zero time for anything else for Fred to commit the crime and to clean up. Now let's look at the undisputable facts. The window period of no activity is 105 minutes. By Fred's own admission, in his plea explanation, it takes about 77 to 80 minutes to English flat and back from Old Mitchell, probably driving at the speed limit, which would leave about 25 to 28 minutes for everything else. Certainly not zero. In April 2008, during an IAI conference in Nebraska, Bertha mentioned that Inga's fiancé, Fred, was in a meeting with 30 other people. And we know there were only about 10 people in the meeting, including the Americans. So likely with that distorted view of Fred's alibi, Bertha proceeded to conduct a series of experiments on a total of 10 drinking glasses of all shapes and sizes, even on some that could not possibly have made girl flying to the following one because it was simply too tall. Now, before taking a lift from each glass, that time would perform what he called typical drinking action. He would first hold the glass in his left hand and pour water into it from his right hand. He would put the glass down, pick it up with his right hand and take a sip from it. And then he would put the glass down again. Then he would uh, apply aluminum powder to each glass and he would take the lift. And in doing so, he found that Polyon 1 matched very well with a lift that he took from his glass number two. And here is a comparison. Now, it may appear that there are some similarities between Bertheim's experimental lift and Polyon 1. And we will deal with this comprehensively in another episode. But suffice to say that Bertheim's lift is a fabrication, a product of all kinds of tricks and undeclared actions to purposefully produce a lift that would resemble Fallen One. It was this discovery that got my brother Thomas to put in thousands of hours, blood, sweat, and tears over a period of 10 years for sake of truth and justice for Inga. This all happened in April 2012. So after reading Anthony Altbaker's book of Fruit of a Poison Tree, Thomas felt that something wasn't right. Something he read in Altbaker's book just made him feel uneasy, but he couldn't put his finger on it. So he went online to look for more information and he found a copy of Pat Wertheim's report. So he decided to repeat Wertheim's experiment exactly as Wertheim said he did it. And then he compared his lift with the lift in Bertram's report. And what he found hit him right between the eyes. He found what was bothering him. The position of the left fingerprints and the right thumbprint on Bertram's lift were too close to one another. This result could only have been achieved by rotating the glass after putting it down and picking it up. And he did not declare this action in his report, nor in his later court testimony. And here we can see an overlay of Bertram's lift with a lift that Thomas made, using the exact same drinking action that Bertram supposedly used. And here you can see that Bertram's prints are not in the right location. and could only have been made after he irritated the glass by about 30 to 35 millimeters before picking it up with his right hand. Now, in the next episode, I will reveal many other little things that Bertrand did to produce this lift. So, in the end, Bertrand concluded that the police had intentionally fabricated Folion 1 and that they had intentionally mislabeled the drinking glass lift as being from a DVD cover. And this is what he said. In summary, after a thorough analysis of lift number one, the Folion represented as having been lifted from a DVD case after evaluating lift number one in light of the report of Mr. Becker and Mr. Porter, and after numerous experiments on a variety of drinking glasses, it is my conclusion that lift number one was taken from a drinking glass 
and was intentionally mislabeled as having come from a DVD case. Lift number one has all of the characteristics of fabricated fingerprint evidence, and in my opinion, is intentionally fabricated fingerprint evidence. He argued that since the lift from a DVD cover could not be found in the remaining 10 lifts, it means that Constable Schwartz did not mistakenly switch the lifts, but that he intentionally mislabeled it. So how did this fabrication happen according to the defense? Well, the defense's version is that when Fred went into the Bishop Lavers police station on April the 12th, to give his statement and his fingerprints, a police officer offered him a glass of water. Then after the interview, the glass was spritted away and Constable Swart took a lift and completed the labels and the description on the back and replaced the original folio one with the new folio one before it was given to Captain Bester to do the comparisons. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, this version of how the fabrication took place was never be put before the court. It was also just said it was fabricated, but they actually never said in court how it was fabricated. I'm also not aware of a sworn statement by Fred van der Paper that he was handed a glass of water during an interview. And even if he was, where's the evidence that prints were lifted from this glass? Now, there are many, many problems with Wertheim's report. And I just want to highlight one particular issue that shows that this investigation was not fair, that it was biased and that it was working towards a specific result. We know that Wertheim had a copy of Wertheim's report in which it is clearly explained how Constable Swartz did a double lift. That lift across the bottom half and then a second lift across the top half. And in this process, the bottom line was formed. It also explained how the curved top line could have been made by the way Schwartz applied pressure to the folion while he was taking this lift. More pressure was applied in the middle than in the sides, and this caused the folion to bend over the edge and in doing so, picking up more powder. So let me provide a very simple explanation of what would that meant. That was apparently too difficult for a multitude of defense experts to understand. Assume we have a DVD cover. The yellow here is fingerprint powder on the rounded edge of the DVD cover. And then we apply a folion that overhangs the DVD by a bit. And the edge of the folion bends unequally over the rounded edge. The powder will logically not be picked up evenly and will sliver like this remain on the folion of which the one side will appear rounded. All of this was explained in Bortis report, and yet Bertheim did not follow Constable Schwartz's procedure at all. He did not handle the DVD to see if the position of the prints could be re re replicated. He did not follow the double lift procedure. He made no effort to prove that even if one followed Schwartz's procedure, the following one would still not be possible. What, and if it was done, then the results were omitted from his, from his report. So the only lift that Bertram took from a DVD was to show the straightness of the edge. And it is easy to lift a neat straight edge lift. And that is what you really desire. So why did Bertram not follow Swatch's procedure? Ask yourself that question. But instead, he had the audacity to fabricate his own print and then to accuse Constable Swartz of fabricating Fallen One. Now, I guess the defense was very quick in presenting Wertheim's report to the state in another attempt to get the state to drop the case against Fred, but it was not going to be that easy. So in, in response to the Wertheim report, the state asked a senior su superintendent, Roger Dixon, from the Forensic Science Laboratory in Pretoria to examine Fallen One in order to determine whether it was lifted from a DVD cover or a drinking glass. Now, this is the same I use my eyes, my lady, Roger Dixon, that testified in his private capacity for the defense in the Oscar Pistorius trial. Your analysis of visibility in the dark, did that require any expert skill? 
Um, my lady, the instruments I used there were my eyes. So Roger Dixon, on November 24th, 2006, received a few items from a Captain Danny from the West Asian. These items included the supposed original DVD cover, the original Folion 1, the original Folion 2, and the 9 tech lifts, and 11 drinking glasses. He said were collected from the flight in Suras. Now that was lie number one. These glasses were not collected from Suras. They were collected from Mrs. Lotz's home. So here are the glasses that supposedly belong to Inge. A glass nine was the tall glass from which Folion 1 was lifted. And glass two was the two prost holder, as can be seen in this crime scene photo. This here is supposedly the actual DVD cover, according to the defense. Apparently, the defense managed to retrieve the actual DVD cover from the video rental place. Now, it's important to note that the dusting and lifting was not done by Roger Dixon himself, but by Captain Van der Westhuizen. It seems like Dixon wasn't an expert enough in dusting and lifting of fingerprints. So Roger Dixon started off by getting from the West Station to take lifts from DVD covers, only over a top half. So like that time, he did not do the double lift. However, Dixon says that Constable Schwartz demonstrated to him how Fallen One was lifted. That's line number two. Schwartz had never met Roger Dixon in his life. The first time he saw Roger Dixon was on TV during the Oscar Pistorius trial. This is what the judge said. With one of the glasses, glass eight, he performed a drinking action of a view to replicate the apparent lip mark, which appears towards the top of the volume. He furthermore arranged for Constable Schwartz to demonstrate to him how he lifted the fingerprint appearing on volume one from the DVD cover in question. So the fact that Schwartz did a demonstration to Dixon seemed to be something that impressed the judge. And yet it was all a lie. So like that time, Dixon took lifts from these 11 drinking glasses. After he picked them up with his right hand and taking a sip. He didn't quite explain how he got the prints from the left hand on the glass. Now Dixon's uh, final conclusion in his section 212 affidavit was, in my opinion, the black volume described in paragraph 3211 was not lifted from a DVD, but instead from one of the four glasses described in paragraph 6.4. The features observed on the folion match test lifts made from the glasses and not those made from the DVD covers. In other words, Nixon said that folion was lifted, the folion one was lifted from one of these four identical glasses. Now, when a court accepts a section 212 affidavit, the contents therein becomes prima facie evidence. In other words, it becomes sufficient to establish a fact, the truth, unless it can be disproved or rebutted. So if the fact established by section 212 is not disputed or rebutted, the court must accept it as the truth, as a fact. That is why such an affidavit must comply with the very stringent requirements of Section 212 of the Criminal Act. It must comply 100%. If not, it's not admissible and it is not up to the discretion of the judge. So when the court accepted Roger Dixon's affidavit, as prima facie evidence, it accepted as fact, as God's truth, all in one came from one of these four glasses and none other. So if we combine the defense's fabrication theory and Dixon's conclusion, then the police removed a glass from Inga's flat, used it to give Fred water during his interview, not afraid that Fred may recognize the glass, and then returned it to the flat after lifting Fred's fingerprints from it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Roger Dixon's affidavit does not comply with the requirements of Section 212 of the Criminal Act. Therefore, it was inadmissible as prima facie evidence in this case. Its acceptance by the court is an error in law that is grounds for a retrial. Now, 
on our website, truthforinga.com, there are a series of blog posts that deals with Dixon and his affidavit. And I will make a, an episode about it at the future time. So it's clearly evident that the judge did not understand section 212 of the act, leading to him accepting this affidavit as prima facie evidence when he should never have done so. This was perhaps because he lacked experience in dealing with criminal cases. So this is what Dr. Klatzow once said in an interview. That Judge Van Sale was a very fine scholar, but as a criminal judge, he had no experience. To him, it was a mystery why he was given this case, as he lacked the street savvy to hear this kind of case. But the pressing question remains. What compelled Roger Dixon to perjure himself like that? To potentially put his career on the line? Was he bribed? Was he blackmailed? Was he threatened? Was he so blinded by this rock solid alibi that he didn't have the guts to go up against it? Or did he so desperately want to play in the same sandbox as Pat Wertheim and Ari Zellenberg? But that's just a secret that he took with him to his grave. Please don't think I'm a coward for passing a man that is deceased and that cannot defend himself. Our findings and allegations against him have been out in the open long before he died. We confronted him directly with it on our website and the social media, and he chose not to respond. So yes. He had every opportunity to defend himself. He chose not to. So when the director of public prosecutions received this affidavit from Roger Dixon, he decided to throw in a towel. Seems like he, like the judge, did not have the insight or the wisdom to realize that this affidavit did not comply with the act, that it was garbage. Now we've asked a legal expert to look at the section 212 affidavit, and this is what he or she said. I, however, wondered whether the 212 of Dixon was adduced in evidence during the trial and was really shocked to read later that it was. My initial view was that the affidavit could only be used as toilet paper, nothing else, and I am still of that view. But this affidavit compelled the Director of Public Prosecutions to, on uh, December the 13th, 2006, to send a letter to Advocate to the Brain uh, Fred's defense lawyer, in which he stated, I hereby confirm that the state no longer intends to proceed with evidence concerning your client's lead fingerprint on a DVD holder. Mission accomplished. The defense won a major battle. So in spite of the state withdrawing the fingerprint evidence, the fingerprint evidence still took center stage in the trial. It was a big fight. Now we must remember at this time the defense was still up against the hammer and the shoe print evidence. And I don't think they were too confident in the strength of the alibi. If the alibi was really that rock solid, why not just put all of that evidence before the court, get it over and done with, instead of spending millions of rands over a brutal nine month period to fight against the fingerprint, hammer and shoe print evidence. On the 19th of December, 2006, in a letter to a shoe print expert, Bull Budjack, took the brain, wrote, to tell him that as far as the fingerprint allegations were concerned, the state has thrown in the towel and has conceded that the fingerprint, in fact, comes from a glass, as the defense claimed, and not from a DVD cover, as has been maintained up to then by the state. The state formally indicated that they are not proceeding with any evidence on the fingerprint aspect. And this, of course, would not exclude us from raising the issue as it constitutes, as far as we're concerned, fraud. This fraud must take the rest of the state's evidence, including the mark on the bathroom floor. Now the defense obviously needed the fingerprint evidence to remain in the case, so that they could use it to taint the judge's view of all of the state's case, for a judge to think that all of the state's case is a fraud. That would, for example, make the judge more amenable 
to accept their outlandish arguments that the hammer could not have made the head wounds or to attach the disproportionate weight to perceived mistakes by the police. And this is exactly what the defense did. Attached to Fred's the explanation were the reports and affidavits by Franz, John Becker, Pat Bertheim, as well as the affidavit by Roger Dixon, as well as the report by Puerta and the letter by the Director of Public Prosecutions. In the plea explanation, it was said, I'm advised that the concession by the state does not prevent my legal representatives from dealing with the fingerprint evidence during the trial. It is indeed my case that the fingerprint evidence was fabricated and fraudulent. Therefore, respectfully, it will be argued that the fingerprint fraud taints the state's case against me. So ladies and gentlemen, it is important to remember that it was the defense that decided to enter the fingerprint evidence into the trial, not the state. Therefore, the state did not try to prosecute Fred with fingerprint evidence. This is what Advocate Van der Pfeiffer said, the state prosecutor. Now, Your Honor, the summary of facts that is in front of you in terms of Article 144 of the Criminal Procedure Act, of course, refers to the alleged fingerprint of the accused that was found on the DVD holder that was rented earlier. It is indeed so that the state is not proceeding with this evidence anymore. It is a decision that was made for specific reasons by the prosecuting authority. If it seems during a trial, and I think we saw a glimpse of it this morning, it will form part of the trial and it will be necessary for the state to present evidence around the lifting of the fingerprints so that the court can put the, to place the court in the position to judge for itself the bona fides and the mala fides of the people involved. It looked like it will become very relevant in the case, and under those circumstances, the state will present this evidence. Now, bona fides mean a person's honesty and sincerity of intention, and mala fides mean bad faith or intent to deceive. Now, remember, according to the defense, Constable Swartz was a criminal, yet he partook in the deliberate fabrication of evidence to frame an innocent person. It was therefore only appropriate of the state to call Constable Swartz to testify so that the court could determine for itself the honesty and dishonesty of Constable Swartz and therefore of the state's case. So in, in support of Constable Swartz's testimony, the state also called his supervisor, Captain Matthias, and the person that does the DVD, Marianne Boysens. At the end, the judge concluded that Pollen 1 could have been the result of a mistake due to negligence or utter incompetence. So in paragraph 126 of his judgment, the judge said, in light of this attitude, advocate from the paper indicated in his opening submission that the state indeed would not continue with the fingerprint evidence, except in as much as it may be necessary to refute the defense's allegations of fraud. Unfortunately, this led to the state presenting a significant amount of testimony, testimony about it. That in turn led to protected cross-examination and furthermore to the testimony of two foreign experts, Mr. Pat Bertheim of the USA and Mr. Ari Zellenberg from the Netherlands being presented. In essence, these witnesses affirmed the findings of Senior Superintendent Dixon and suggested that somewhere in the procedure, followed by the investigation team, a serious flaw had slipped in. While these experts considered it an intentional fabrication, it cannot be excluded that it could maybe be attributed to negligence or utter incompetence. However, it is for the present purposes irrelevant because the merits of this case can be decided without having to make a finding on this. Now, I find the use of the word unfortunately very unfortunate and very revealing. Why 
wasn't it unfortunate of the defense the proceeding of the fingerprint evidence after the state already withdrew it. But it was unfortunate for the state to attempt to disprove very serious and personally damaging allegations of fraud. Now the judge acknowledged that the police could have been negligent or utterly incompetent, but he refuses to explore how through incompetence or negligence a print taken from one of the four identical glasses that Inger owned came to be labeled as a DVD cover and what happened with the real DVD lift then? How can the issue of whether there was an error be irrelevant? If the court wasn't lazy and gave it the consideration it warranted and then came to the conclusion that an error was highly likely or highly unlikely, would it have still favored the fabrication argument? even though there wasn't a shred of evidence before the court that the print was fabricated or how it was fabricated? Or could the court have determined that there is at least some likelihood that Torian one did come from a DVD holder instead of just completely dismissing it? So ladies and gentlemen, that is how the defense won the case. They managed to manipulate an inexperienced judge to accept Torian one was not from the DVD cover, but from a drinking glass. In getting to that point, many people crossed a line through unprofessional conduct, deception, fabrication, and perjury. And in the process, they were also successful in executing their strategy to taint all of the state's case. That may explain why the police in general and some of the state witnesses were so disrespected by the judge, while the defense witnesses who were spewing nothing but nonsense were held in such high esteem. The proof of what I'm saying will become abundantly clear in future episodes. So that's all for today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your time. In the next episode, I will look at the work done by Pat Wertheim and Ari Zillenberg. It will be very revealing. Until then, stay tuned. Thank you.